Welcome to this short lecture on the breast. This lecture will essentially cover both the anatomy of the breast and the development of the breast, but also the physiology of lactation. So, firstly we're going to cover how the breast first developed, how it looks in the adult, and then finally how does milk get produced. So in terms of lactation or milk production, the main purpose of this is to provide nutrition for the new baby or the neonate. It's thought that the breast developed out of an accessory gland of the skin, probably a combination of sweat and oil gland. And it was first believed that the advantage for the baby was it produced certain antimicrobial agents and antibodies to prevent the baby who ingested this particular material from the mother to protect it from being um, infected or if there was an infection, the, the mother would produce antibodies for it. So the first primary function of milk production was probably more as an immune response or an immune protective agent. Then as we kind of move through into mammals and so forth, the milk became much more abundant and therefore it became a nutrition source. But the take home message here is that lactation is actually, or the breast should I say, is actually a skin structure. So when we look at firstly this image, this is where in the embryo we have uh, at about eight weeks, we just have the front of the body wall here in the embryo. And so because this is a skin, this is going to be, this, this layer here is going to be ectoderm. So that's the developing outer covering of the baby. Now there is a condensation here, which is the mammary um, bud, um, mammary blood, bud, which is kind of a condensation of ectoderm. And that is, is basically going to be the characteristic point at about eight weeks. Moving through to about 20, what starts to develop is a mammary duct. So a duct that starts to actually go into the tissue or the stroma itself. So this is the same in both sexes, so nothing's really different at this point. And as the mother is um, moving through her pregnancy, certain hormones are increasing from the production in the placenta. Most notably, we have a huge increase in estrogen, a huge increase in progesterone, which then goes up to the hypothalamus and causes an increase in prolactin release from the anterior pituitary gland. And as we move through to birth, what starts to happen is this duct starts to branch off and starts to form kind of lobules. And so at birth, regardless of sex, there is a capacity with these kind of branching lobules to produce milk. So the baby at birth from all those hormones from the mother's placenta can actually secrete small amounts of milk, which is usually termed witch's milk. Now, as the placenta passes, those huge amounts of hormones in the mother starts to drop down. So these kind of atrophy a bit off. And so we go back to that kind of original state, like so. And this remains about, about the same all the way up to puberty. So regardless of male and female, the, the ductal system and the breast in terms of its size doesn't really change. And that budding area there, which um, will become the precursor to the nipple, is the same in the male and the female. So it's not until we move into puberty that this starts to become more characteristic of the adult. So with the increased amount of estrogen, um, so as we move into puberty for the female, estrogen levels go up from the developing ovary and the developing oocytes. So we start to have more branching occur. So estrogen has a stronger effect on ductal growth. And so with that, so the estrogen causes a branching in the duct system and then progesterone, which is released from the corpus luteum, which is the outer part of the, where the egg was released in the ovary, that will cause more lobular formations in the end part of the ducts. And so that really will start to develop the breast in the female, which will move to the adult form. So when, when we look at the adult breast in the female, let's first start on the, the wall of the thorax. 
So in the wall of the, of the thorax we have the ribs which are in green here and so if you count down before the adult breast develops if you actually go to the fourth intercostal space so about here so one two three four that's usually the level of the nipple in the male and the um, prepubescent female. So <clears throat> moving or between the ribs we've got the intercostal um, muscles the internal and external and then if you move forward or anterior on the thorax wall you have these two pectoral muscles. The pectoral muscles being the pectoral minor and the major sitting much lower which kind of forms the posterior surface of the breast to sit on. Between these muscles you have these connective tissue fascia which kind of engulf each of these muscles and comes into a collective area and this connective tissue kind of continues into the breast proper itself which kind of goes around the breast. Now it's important to note that there's actually connected tissue that runs through and supports all these ductal systems and then goes back to the back wall. And so this is kind of like a ligamental support network. And this is what we term Cooper's ligaments. And they kind of attach to the front wall of the breast and go through these blue ductal systems, okay, connect to those and go all the way back to the posterior wall or the fascia around the, the pectoralis muscles. And that actually gives, it's more notable on the upper surface of the breast and so when the breast actually starts to fill with milk, it gives that additional support. Now as a clinical point, these um, ligaments, these Cooper ligaments, if there is any kind of invasive cancer and the cancer is growing out of the ductal system, it can actually pull on those Cooper ligaments, which can cause a kind of like a dimpling effect on the breast, which can be a clinical sign of a cancerous tumour within the breast itself. Now, so that's the kind of outside anatomy. Looking at the kind of orange-yellow structure here, that is the skin. And the skin, just like anywhere else in the body, um, is epidermal. And then if we kind of go down to this part of the breast, which is the areole and nipple, there's a much more high density of um, melanocytes. So there's going to be a different colour in, in the areola and then in the nipple. And that even becomes darker in the pregnant female as well with the change in hormones. Around here we have a greater abundance of sebaceous glands to help lubricate or keep the, the breast and nipple uh, moist and preventing it to dry out, etc. And then we have a, a greater abundance of smooth muscle around the nipple which can as assist with milk expulsion. These ductal units which we saw in the development here is primarily driven by the estrogen levels in the female um, menstrual cycle. So the ductal units which equate to lobes and in each lobule or lobe of the breast there are approximately 15 to 20 lobes. So these ductal systems will drain each one of these lobes, each one of these 15 to 20 lobes. And it's the progesterone that causes the further branching, or if you zoom in on this ductal system, you can see the outgrowth, which is the avioles, and that is actually driven by progesterone release. So progesterone, estrogen causes the ductal expansion, progesterone causes the dilatation and the areas to produce the end of the lobules, which is the avioles, which is actually the milk producing area and you can see the cells here lining that area. So that is each of the branching areas will, which is predominantly driven by progesterone, it is kind of at the end of each of these um, ducts. Now as the duct which drains each lobule will go towards the nipple and they start to coalesce in together, these coalescing duct system is called the lactiferous ducts and then they will move through where they will eventually meet, coalesce together as a confluence and that would expel milk out of the nipple. So that's essentially the anatomy. Estrogen is also very important in producing um, fat and so actually I'll draw in purple all of the breast is 80 to 85 percent of the breast which I'm drawing now is actually adipose tissue or fat. 
So the majority of the size of the breast is driven by fat, which is driven by estrogen. So the estrogen from puberty is what gives the bulk to the breast. The ligaments, so the Cooper's ligaments, is what gives the shape to the breast. Estrogen also gives the ductal system, whereas progesterone gives more the lobules and the avioles. So now we're going to move to now the pregnancy side or the, the lactation side. And the hormones that I want you to be noteful of is um, estrogen, progesterone, prolactin, and uh, oxytocin. So um, when, the, when the mother becomes pregnant, the initial change in estrogen and progesterone comes from the ovary. So it will come from um, the, initially from the eggs and then from the corpus luteum. But as the fetus becomes bigger and bigger, it will start to develop a placenta and the placenta starts to increase the amount of estrogen and the progesterone in the blood. This will further develop the ductal system. So the breast will start to become bigger. The duct system becomes elongated and the progesterone will cause more branching. So I'm not going to draw it, but you could imagine that all these ductal systems will start to get these buds coming off it. And that will start to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? So with the combination of estrogen and progesterone, the duct system will start to be expanded out. And you'll probably lose the fat, but we will start to gain size in the, the ducts and the lobules. As well as the estrogen and progesterone effect in the breast, it's also going to go up to the brain and it's going to cause a change um, in the release on the anterior pituitary gland because normally pro, uh, prolactin is inhibited by dopamine, which stops prolactin release. But in the pregnant female, the high amounts of estrogen, the high, most, high amounts of progesterone will cause an increase in prolactin release, which is going to come down and start to change the epithelial cells okay, in the alveoli, which are the milk producing cells for the mother. Another important structure here, which you can see in red, are these kind of spider-like muscle cells or muscle epithelial cells or myoepithelial cells, which wrap themselves around each alveoli kind of lobule. And they're very important for squeezing the milk out, okay? But we won't talk about how that happens yet. So as the, the estrogen progesterone is increasing and we have a greater development and expansion of the ductal and lobule or alveoli system, the breast will get bigger and the pro prolactin will increase. However, because you've got pro progesterone, there's going to be no milk, actual milk production through the prolactin. So the progesterone actually inhibits milk production. Okay, so if you zoom in one of these cells, this is the actual epithelial cell here. There is the my epithelial cell here, and that's the inside structure of the cell. So this would be secreting out into the lumen. Now prolactin would act here to cause the production of milk to be excreted into the tubule and along the ductal system out to the nipple. But with the exposure to high levels of progesterone, this is kind of blocked off. So there's no produce, production of um, milk at, in, in pregnancy as of yet. There might be a small bit of leakage, but there won't be any amount. Now when the baby is born and then the subsequent placenta is delivered, we have a huge, in the mother, we have a huge drop in both estrogen and in progesterone. Therefore, the prolactin is now uninhibited. So it's not inhibited anymore. So therefore, the cells have free range to start to secrete its products. Now, the cells itself, lining the lobules and avioles, kind of will secrete its milk in five ways. Okay. So there's five, five kind of different pathways to secrete the milk out. There's some that kind of, so if this is your nucleus in the cell, there's some that kind of work off exocytosis. So certain things that like proteins, so certain milk proteins will be produced in the nucleus with the help of prolactin, which causes um, these proteins and calcium and lactose to be kind of engulfed up in um, small little vesicles which will be excisotosed out into the 
lumen, so out and into here. This is what we call the aqueous phase of lactation. And so it has, in this particular phase, we have high amounts of protein, high amounts of lactose, high amounts of calcium that are excreted out in an exocytosed manner. Another way of, pro of producing uh, constituents is through fat. And so these yellowy things are just fat globules which kind of get engulfed and pushed out into the lobule as well, into the lumen as well, should I say. There's also special trans, um, transporting proteins that kind of push um, some substrates up into the end of the cell and out in the lumen. So these could be things like immunoglobulins. So this is for the antibodies productions. So antibodies get pushed through the cell um, from the outside basal lemma through the cell and then into the lumen. So that's antibodies, which are very important for immune function. And then we have all the um, ions and the fluid and the water and so forth that will be secreted out through the cell as well. Finally, there is a transport system that goes between the cells. So this would be a, a paracellular transport and that can help further with fluid movement into the lumen, but also ion movement such as sodium and chloride and etc. And so all these components together is what gives the milk which would start to come and uh, collect within these avioles. Primarily driven by prolactin. So prolactin is produced fr from the hypothalamus or into the anterior pituitary gland or well, from the anterior pituitary gland regulated from the hypothalamus through dopamine amounts and that causes prolactin to release come down and cause the cells to release its constituents into there. Now when the baby comes along and it starts to suckle on the breast there are special receptors around this part of the breast special mechanoreceptors which will transport nervous impulse into the thoracic wall up into the brain up into the thalamus hypothalamus should I say um, down into the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. Oxytocin then comes almost immediately so you're talking within minutes to come down to these myoepithelial cells and that causes it to contract and push the milk out. So the milk gets pushed out with the release of oxytocin which is coming from the posterior pituitary gland as a result of mechanical stimulants from the suckling of the baby and that will push the fluid out. Now the initial um, release of fluid is mostly going to be probably more aqueous so the start of the milk is going to be more fluid like and then the fats come a bit later so the fats are probably in the, the latter part of the feed which probably gives the, um, the sensation to the baby to be more full so the, probably the start of the, the feed is probably more um, hydration and then the, the latter part is more for the fat. I should note also here that the first feed from the baby is um, the clostrium and which is not really much bulk to it so it's not it hasn't got the, st the same constituents of the normal milk it's probably got a lot lower um, fat a lot lower um, lactose probably a higher protein and much more uh, immunoglobulins and antimicrobials and essential and essentials like that which they think that it not only goes to the baby to kind of seed their gastrointestinal tract which is important for them to have a patent gastrointestinal system but to also help with immunity straight away. It also is also thought that the um, clostrium ha is also important for having a, laxat a laxative effect which p helps the baby pass the first stool which is the meconium. So that's kind of how it all feeds in. We've got in, in the, the, the feeding side of thing we've got the combination of the oxytocin which squeezes it out and prolactin which develops the, the milk products which pushes it off into the alveoles and the lobules. Prolactin is kind of highest, its secretion is highest about 30 minutes after the feed which further develops the milk. So it's kind of a demand um, driven thing. So the more milk that leaves, the more prolactin comes down and the more production. So if there's less demand, there's less production and that's how they work together. Finally with the baby, there's kind of three reflexes the baby has straight away. It has the, the rooting reflex which is kind of around the, the surface of the cheek. So if you were to um, brush a newborn's cheek 
with your finger, it would turn to the stimulus. Okay, so that would be kind of, I guess, looking at if it's close to the nipple, the nipple um, brushing against the cheek, it would move towards it. So that's the rooting reflex. The next one is the suckling reflex. So any stimulus on the hard palate of the baby will cause it to suckle. So by putting the nipple into the mouth and the nipple hitting the, the, the top palate will cause the baby to suckle. That's the suckling reflex. And then finally, any fluid that's in the mouth will cause a swallow reflex. And that's the swallowing reflex. So by the baby attaching to the, around the, the later, lateral part of the nipple, that's gonna cause those reflexes to occur and then milk to be stimulated through the afferent response to the brain, releasing oxytocin, and then that whole system manifests. So hopefully now you have a better understanding of not only how the breast developed, how the anatomy is important now in the adult, but also the physiology of lactation.